Peter Kremlin, live on Sky News Australia. Good evening. Great to have your company. Here's what's coming up tonight on Kremlin. More proof today that the Prime Minister's word can't be trusted. Even though he once said, my word is my bond, with documents revealing a $15 billion national reconstruction fund was not in fact open for business as the Prime Minister had earlier claimed. First, we rolled over to the Chinese ownership of the Port of Darwin. Now, during the visit to Canberra by China's foreign minister, we've backed down on wind turbines, paving the way for billions of dollars worth of Chinese imports to flood the market. Growing concern, too, about changes to planning rules that will allow the rollout of renewables to be fast-tracked, regardless of what local communities have to say. A planning expert says this will lead to terrible decisions. We'll speak to that professor a little later in the show. And that interview with Donald Trump where the Republican frontrunner makes it clear he's no fan of our ambassador, Kevin Rudd. And what's interesting is not just the Rudd assessment, but how angry the Prime Minister became when asked about it in the Parliament today. He won't be there long if that's the case. I don't know much about him. Uh, I heard he was a little bit nasty. Uh, I hear he's not the brightest bulb, uh, but I don't know much about him. But if, uh, if he's at all hostile, he will not be there long. But first, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, does he have a pathological problem with telling the truth? Today we learn from emails obtained under Freedom of Information that the federal government's new $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund had never been open for business in January, as the Prime Minister had repeatedly claimed under questioning at the time. We have the National Reconstruction Fund, which is up and running, which is uh, published uh, very clearly. It's guidelines for funding. And uh, the Liberal Party seemed to, seemed to be upset that there's not an online form that you can fill in. Up and running, he says, but two weeks after those comments that the fund was operational, internal correspondence dated the 24th of January said that officials were still working on draft investment guidance. It was not until January 22, so says the FOI documents, that the NRF's board signed off on the application process. Now, no big deal, you might think, because in the glare of the media, it's easy enough to get confused about what's already operational and what's only about to be. But repeated claims that something is up and running when it isn't, and then attacking the opposition for their follow-up questions, says to me that this isn't a mere truth oversight, but a deliberate pattern of behaviour from our nation's top leader. The opposition's deputy leader, Susan Lay, well, she went further today in The Australian, saying the PM's been caught out lying. And that then prompted this exchange in question time. Secret government documents reported in The Australian today reveal Order. the funding application process for the NRF was only created after the Prime Minister made these claims. Why did the Prime Minister deliberately mislead this parliament? Mr Speaker, the Deputy Leader knows full well that there are some statements that can only be made by direct resolution. Uh, and um, that, well, I'd, I'd put that the question should be out of order completely. Like that was eyes wide open, breach of the standing orders. I withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Can the Prime Minister please explain the inconsistency between the two statements he made? Very, very defensive today. And when you think back to some of the other things the Prime Minister hasn't been upfront about, doubts about his honesty and character are real. Now, obviously, there's that claim repeated over 100 times that his government would deliver a 275 per household per year cut in power prices that the government all but abandoned yesterday. Albanese and his incompetent sidekick Chris Bowen have tried to blame the Ukraine war and its impact on energy prices for the broken promise. But given that the war started in February and the promises kept being made, well, that doesn't stack up. Ensuring that renewables uh, are 82 per cent of the system uh, of the national energy market by 2030 uh, will reduce energy costs by $275. Cheaper electricity bills, $275 a year off your electricity bill. 
Again, the war started in February. Look at those dates in May. Then there was the claim that cutting emissions by Labor's target of 42% by 2030 would deliver more than 600,000 jobs. As former Labor MP, former head of the ACTU, Jenny George, pointed out in The Australian on the weekend, the government's modelling only tallied up extra green jobs, not lost coal jobs. What's more, the PM's claim that more renewable power would cut bills when all the experience shows that more renewables raises bills, was at the very least recklessly indifferent to the truth. Then there was the PM's constant reassurances that the government was fully committed, he said, to the stage three legislated tax cuts, right up to a few days before it wasn't. In January this year, we know he was out there spruiking it hard, but we also found out only a few weeks ago that back in December, Treasury were already working up an alternative plan to dump the cuts. Confirm that we haven't changed our position. We have no change to our plan. You promised to those Australian families the stage three tax cuts will come into effect in July in full. Well, we haven't changed our position on that. The first time that Treasury looked at this was after the 11th of December when you were tasked with the job by the Treasury Secretary. Is that right? So we are always looking at these solutions, so I can't emphatically say it was the first time. Uh, we were conscious that it was a commitment of the government to implement Stage 3, but as public servants, we will look at and provide advice. Even after rumours had made it into the press, the PM kept insisting those tax cuts were safe. Here he is just a couple of days prior to the bombshell broken promise under questioning on January 17. Well, we have, we have no change to our plans. Are they going uh, to happen? Important. Well, tax cuts will happen in July. And uh, we're... The same committed. as what we're committed to? We're committed to that. Well, we haven't changed our position on okay. that. Public servants said they were looking back in December at changing position. Now, this is extraordinary. We know they already had taxpayer-funded ads underway. This led to one journalist openly accusing the Prime Minister of lying. Do you accept that this was a lie and why should Australians trust that you won't lie to them again? Then after the Chinese sonar injuries to two Australian sailors, the government dropped the news after the Prime Minister had boarded a plane and couldn't be contacted by the media. It was some days later before he fronted journalists again, hoping it might have all blown over, but it had not. And he was then asked if he had raised the incident, incident with the Chinese leader, a key of, of course, had just met with President Xi. Albanese claimed that he'd never talk about private meetings. He says, I'd never talk about private meetings with any world leader, even though routinely he talks about the content of meetings all the time. But Anthony Albanese is not the only member of his government who's got a serious truth deficit. Other ministers seem equally truth challenged. When asked pre-election about possible workplace relation changes such as industry-wide bargaining, the Treasurer said, quote, it's not part of our policy. Even though, plainly, we've seen the legislative changes, it was. Also, today the government was found out to have quietly abandoned the anti-dumping action against Chinese wind turbines. Reported with great fanfare by that mouthpiece of the Chinese communists, the Global Times, just as the foreign minister of China, Wang Yi, was in Canberra for bilateral meetings. I mean, what a coincidence, you might say. Yet when asked by reporter Ben Packham whether it was indeed just coincidental that this was all announced during the Chinese foreign minister's visit and whether it was perhaps a trade-off for China ending bans on our wine and lobster, our foreign minister refused to say. The government has now dropped its anti-dumping action against Chinese wind turbines. Um, the Global Times says uh, this shows Australia's distancing itself from the anti-China position of the US. Is this a quid pro quo? There's no relationship uh, between uh, the wine dispute and the steel disputes. Minister Husek has made uh, uh, a, an evidence ba uh, ba has made a decision based on the apolitical and evidence-based recommendation from the anti-dumping commissioner. 
It tells you how serious it was that that was the first question in her press conference. Packham's not stupid. Anyone who thinks that Australia dropping that anti-dumping action wasn't a trade-off is dreaming. This government's always giving things away in order to curry favour with China, like the PM announcing that the government would take no action against Chinese ownership of the port of Darwin just prior to his trip to Beijing last year. Yet again, this government refuses to admit what's obvious. It would rather tell a lie than admit the uncomfortable truth, even though it was the Prime Minister himself the day before the election who said this. As leaders, what do you have that Scott Morrison doesn't? I have integrity and the capacity to take responsibility. You're right. No wonder the veteran commentator Ray Hadley was moved to say this on Sydney Radio Today. Every day I get surprised by the Albanese government, who I think now are the worst Labor government since Federation. I mean, incompetence is one thing, and there's plenty of that in the Albanese government. But lies are corrosive, and they go to the heart of this Prime Minister's character or lack of it. All right, let's go to Canberra now for the headlines. Sky News political reporter Olivia Caisley. Good evening. Foreign Minister Penny Wong has told her Chinese counterpart Australians were shocked by the suspended death sentence handed to Aussie writer Yang Hengjun. We will continue to advocate uh, on his behalf. The first visit by a Chinese foreign minister since 2017 comes as the two nations try to stabilise ties following a frosty diplomatic period. The past twists and turns over the decade leaves us with lessons to draw on as well as valuable experience. But we want to continue to engage. During the bilateral talks, Australia welcomed Chinese steps towards lifting sanctions on Aussie wine. They're expected to make a final decision on resuming trade by the end of this month. But no breakthrough was reached on Aussie lobster and beef. We believe it's in the interests of both nations for all trade impediments to be removed. Tariffs on Australian wine should be lifted, they should be lifted forthwith, and they should never have been applied in the first place. Senator Wong denied a decision to lift anti-dumping tariffs on Chinese-made wind turbines had been a quid pro quo exchange with Beijing. Former Prime Minister Paul Keating will meet with Wang Yi on Thursday. It was quite pointed of the Chinese embassy to seek the meeting with Paul Keating, and it is somewhat insulting towards Penny Wong and the Albanese government for that meeting to be taking place. Donald Trump says Australia's ambassador to the United States, Kevin Rudd, could be out of a job if he's re-elected as US president in November. He won't be there long if that's the case. I don't know much about him. Uh, I heard he was a little bit nasty. Uh, I hear he's not the brightest bulb, uh, but I don't know much about him. But if, uh, if he's at all hostile, he will not be there long. In the past, when asked if his commentary could impact his ability to continue as ambassador, Kevin Rudd had this to say. My comments in the past have been those of an independent think tanker. I haven't done them uh, as uh, the Australian ambassador to the United States. Foreign Minister Penny Wong defended the former Prime Minister. His experience and skills mean he will be able to work closely with whomever is elected by the Australian, by the American people as the United States President. And just last week, Anthony Albanese said he was confident in Kevin Rudd's ability to continue on in his role. He He's done... An amazing job. A spokesman for the Australian government said Kevin Rudd is doing a good job as Australia's ambassador to the United States. Right, more on all of that. Let's bring my national affairs editor at the Daily Telegraph, Sky News host James Morrow, and Sky News senior reporter Carolyn Marcus. Um, my panel, I think I called you my editor there, but you're not, of course, James Morrow. <laughs> um, these, these Albanese lies, I went through the detail there. The latest is obviously this freedom of information investigation by the Australian. He was out there saying the fund was operational in January, going pretty hard after the opposition for claims. They said, look, it's not all you say it is. It's not up and running. He said, yes, it is. FOIs out today show it was not. It's less about the ins and outs so much of this as a pattern of behaviour. And I think there's, there's a real character flaw in this Prime Minister. It, it is a Prime Minister without character, but I think it's a government now that, that is in the sort of whatever it takes category, whatever it takes to win and whatever it takes to stay there. 
Yeah, look, I think, Peter, you've hit on something really important here. What you just said there was a government without character, but there's another word for that. It's a government, I think, without ideas. You know, they had one big idea, the voice, which Albanese punted on in his acceptance speech, and then they ran with that, and that didn't work. And ever since then, they've kind of been left not knowing really what they stood for, except for, as you say, this sort of whatever-it-takes attitude. And there's an interesting corollary to this, too. Have you noticed, Peter, how in Question Time, every single time they're attacked now, you know, they're very quick and very glib with the response, well, Peter Dutton, you said this back then, or Paul Fletcher, you said that back then, you know, all of these sorts of, sorts of just turning it around. And this is something that's been happening, I think, since The Voice, when they made a concerted effort to, you know, have their attack lines on the ready, but they didn't do the important thing after that, which was to figure out what their philosophical ballast was, what their keel was going forward, where they were going. And as a result, now we're in this situation where they're kind of rudderless, very just lashing out at everybody. But again, we don't know where they're going, mm -hmm. and these lies keep stacking up. I have to say, I've mean, been in government too, the announcement's the easy part. It's actually getting it to happen, you know, following up with departments and getting all the procedures ticked off and getting it launched. And that's, I think, where they're falling down. It's like this issue with detainees. Uh, they make the announcements, they get the legislation through the parliament with the cooperation of the Libs, uh, but then they fall over in all of these people, in the monitoring of these people, and, and as we know now, Caroline, these court cases. But we find out today, too, we've got a 42-year-old foreign detainee, a rapist, spends two years in prison for raping a 19-year-old girl at a party, uh, behind bars for causing harm to a, a government official. That's the other offence. He's had his bracelet removed. He's out free in the community. And apparently there's other cases where this is uh, pretty much the same thing. It's extraordinary, Peter. And look, this government promised the public that they would do everything in their power to keep the community safe after the High Court made that decision to release a detainee that, that opened the floodgates to around 129 detainees in total being released. This particular man, as you say, he was a 42-year-old Cuban former detainee who was released as part of those um, uh, following the High Court decision, he had uh, raped a teenage girl, a 19-year-old girl who was asleep at a party and then harmed an official after that. His lawyers have been arguing in court that the strict conditions, which include the ankle bracelet and a curfew that he was given upon his recent release, were too punitive and they had left him with too much of a disruption to his daily life and were sending him mad. Well, cry me a river. He raped a young woman in her sleep and then harmed a public official, and yet he has somehow been turned around to become a victim. But instead of fighting this case in court, the government and the immigration minister, Andrew Giles, has pretty much laid down and said, look, we want to defuse potential possible legal challenges, so we're just going to withdraw this case, we're going to settle it, and they've agreed to let him essentially not have to wear this bracelet anymore. So this rapist is out in the community. The Australian newspaper is reporting there are at least three other cases that it knows of, which there were similar legal challenges to those conditions that were imposed. And then how many more of these detainees are we going to see this happen with? And we also know in question time, when asked about this repeatedly, the government's refusing to provide any details to the Australian public. I mean, it's not the Minister Andrew Giles, not just treating the opposition with contempt, he's treating Australians with contempt because there's another, what, 127, I think the number is, 127 right now, cases before the High Court. It'll bring it close to 350 out in the community. We've got no idea where they are if they don't start answering some questions. Um, James, put your American uh, election hat mm -hmm. on. Talk to me about Kevin Rudd and those comments today from uh, <coughs> presidential hopeful Donald Trump. He mm. didn't miss it, his interview with Nigel Farage. I mean, I love it. It's vintage Trump. Calls him nasty says he's not the brightest bulb. I mean, I know he pretends he doesn't know much about Kevin Rudd. This is, the, this is Donald Trump. Yeah. But, I mean, remember when Trump was coming back in 2013. I'll go and dig up the footage for my viewers tomorrow night, but all of those comments from his colleagues... I, I looked at the defence today of, Trump, of Rudd by Penny Wong and I did have a wry smile because she laid into him 
a Tanya Plevisek laid into him. I mean, most of the people that are working with Albanese now were haters of Trump. Now, is this going to impact his ability to stay in the ambassador's lodge in the States? Well, quite possibly. And I mean, look, I think that what Trump said about, you know, I don't know much about him isn't true. I don't think that that's true at all. I think Trump knew exactly who he was talking about. And that hit that Trump made on Rudd felt absolutely precisely character uh, coordinated to wound Rudd, you know, both calling him basically irrelevant and also not that smart. I mean, what a way to prick Kevin Rudd's bubble right there in saying that. Um, 100%. You know, 100%. It is, but, but it is really funny, too, now to think about this, Peter. You know, Kevin Rudd sitting there in Washington, this happens. He's the ambassador. He can't say anything. He can't pick up the phone and get on Twitter. He must be just absolutely seething with frustration over this. As to whether or not he can stay in the role um, as ambassador, well, you know, we'll see about that if Trump does uh, does make it to Inauguration Day, an Election Day in November and then January. But, boy, I think that Trump absolutely scored a bullseye with this and knew exactly what he was doing, Peter. Don't forget, if you want to see that full interview tonight, Nigel Farage, Donald Trump, head-to-head, 8.30 -head, here on Sky News. Caroline, just going back to, to your comments before about these ankle bracelets and, and the efficacy of them, I need to pick up what's happened in Victoria to do t today as well. They've announced that they're going to have ankle bracelets uh, for juvenile offenders out on bail. There's a huge crime wave in Victoria. A lot of young offenders, some as young as 10. Uh, pretty horrific home invasions and other violent crimes. There is a debate about their effectiveness, of course, but also, uh, look, wearing these bracelets, if the crimes are committed... The police aren't going to turn up and stop the crime being committed. All this will do is give them evidence to go back into the courts, argue the young person has breached bail and put them behind bars. Perhaps it's better than nothing, but it's not necessarily the solution. Stopping the crime is what people want, isn't it? Absolutely. And as you say, we've had, we've had a surge in youth crime across the country, but we've seen some really disturbing cases in Victoria, including the murder of a doctor recently in, by two, allegedly by two uh, young teenagers, one of whom was out on bail. Something like this wouldn't prevent that crime, as you point out, from happening when a, an offender is out on bail, an alleged offender, um, for a crime. But it would, uh, I guess, help police in the monitoring of them. It, what, you know what would really help, though, Peter? If the courts actually took a tougher approach and when someone breaches bail for the first time, no matter how young they are, they actually put them behind bars. Or, you know what, even more controversial, don't give bail for serious crimes in the first place, even if it is a young offender, because we know that the rates of recidivism are... are very high. So I think they, they could start with that for one thing. But look, this is a trial that's happening, Victoria. It's part of a broader approach. They're also looking, on the other hand, at raising the age of criminal responsibility from 10 to 12. So while they are looking at putting these uh, monitoring bracelets on, on um, kids as young mm. as 14, they're also saying that kids who are 10 and 11 can't be held responsible for crime. So... It's a sort of confused approach. Now, this might just be a straw in the wind in the fight against woke James, but two <laughs> things here are interesting. Rip Curl went down the path on International Women's Day of having a biological man, trans woman, out there selling the brand. Uh, they've had a huge drop in sales, unsurprisingly. Women want to see women in bathers and, uh, and wetsuits and the, and the like. So they've now gone and hired themselves Stephanie Gilmore to front the brand to try and turn things around. But also the headmaster of the King's School in Sydney, he's taken aim at wokeness. He's written an op-ed for his school's journal. His name's Tony George. He says wokeness has evolved into a broader social movement of complaint and victimhood. Now, I have to say, too often men... Are, are, are spooked out of the public domain here. They don't speak up, but they don't fight back. In his case, he's certainly fighting back for the rights of boys as being equitable with the rights of girls, but he's taking aim at woke. What did you think?
Yeah, look, I thought good on Tony right there for that. I mean, I thought his his response was very careful, very considered, very measured, and, of course, very misinterpreted by an awful lot of people who are just looking to stoke up the flames of envy because, oh, you know, it's a private school and, you know, and they act like it's this bastion of white male privilege and all of this sort of nonsense, which is, of course, silly. But I do feel like, you know, we have hit a certain point where the absurdities of wokeness have gone so far that, you know, we are starting to see a bit of that pendulum swing. You mentioned Rip Curl. I think that this is an important contribution to the debate because, you know, I think I'd also tie it into the whole issue with Sam Kerr and the cop in London, you know, because we do sort of seem to, in this quest for equality, actually wind up with this very striated society on the left about who's, you know, you can poke fun at, who you can't. And I think that these are all different things that are, you know, starting to resolve themselves, I think, finally in a positive direction, Peter. If we want good men, we have to bring up good boys. And I just don't like this idea that we throw young boys under the bus all the time. Thank you both, James Morrow and Caroline Marcus, right after the break. Why China's foreign minister's visit to Australia looks like nothing more than a free publicity stunt as the Albanese government caves in on a key trade measure. Plus, how farmers are being left with no recourse but costly legal action as the Victorian government ploughs ahead with its unrealistic renewables target. An expert is here next. Welcome back to the come, the planning expert who's sounding the alarm on the Victorian government's shambolic plan to fast-track renewables largely at the expense of local and farming communities. But first to Penny Wong's meeting with her Chinese counterpart, Wang Yi, the highest-ranking Chinese figure, to visit Australia since 2017. Now, no doubt the government will be keen to tout this as a win for diplomacy, but given we have dropped anti-dumping action against Chinese wind turbines, and the visit has only amplified Paul Keating's constant bemoaning of the AUKUS agreement, it's hard not to think the Chinese propagandists have had a PR win. Joining me now to discuss this, foreign editor at The Australian, Greg Sheridan, well, Greg, what do you think Australia's actually got out of these talks? Well, uh, Peter, great to be with you. Um, look, I actually think Penny Wong did very well here. The Chinese humiliated and um, uh, insulted the Albanese government by elevating their most abusive critic, Paul Keating. I mean, every time Keating abuses Albanese and Wong in personal derogatory terms he's praised in the Chinese nationalist media. Then they had a lunch today in which they invited the other great AUKUS critic, Hugh White, a much more civil person than Keating. And what I liked about Wong's performance today was that three times in Wong Yi's presence, in the introductory remarks, then in the talks themselves and then in her press conference, she listed our grievances with China. And she was very direct. She said, she told Wang Yi, Australians are shocked by the death sentence imposed on our citizen, that we object to human rights violations in Hong Kong, Tibet and Xinjiang, that we want China to observe the law of the sea in the South China Sea. Now, now Peter, this is not sort of a super Churchill moment, but compared to the spinelessness of the Albanese government over the last six months. And you know what? I think this is just a theory. I've no inside information about this. I think their attempt to bully her mm. by elevating Keating. I mean, she's the only member of the entire Albanese cabinet that ever displays any backbone. And I think that, you know, in a sense, this may well have contributed to her saying publicly what Albanese and certainly poor old Richard Miles have not been willing to say these last six or eight months. So did we get anything out of it? No, but it's good that we have a dialogue with the Chinese foreign minister and it's good that they know that our government will still call them out. Australia is still Australia, as Wong says. Well, I'll, I'll pay your comments on Wong. I do agree she's got a backbone and she's saying things that the others are not prepared to say, at least publicly. Uh, but it all goes to a presentation of a weak government. I mean, you've got this decision on the Chinese wind towers uh, pulling that WTO action. I mean, the timing is obviously around the Wang Yi visit. Uh, this means we're to be flooded with Chinese wind, Chinese made wind turbines and solar panels. We already buy about 90% of our stock from China. You then had that, that correlation between the port of Darwin, that being whitewashed, just as Anthony Albanese is heading off to Beijing. He was previously, as you know, a very strong critic 
against that Port of Darwin deal. I mean, are we rolling over at the cost of our sovereignty here? Yeah, I think you make a very good case, Peter. And all I would say is the I'm a little happier today than I was yesterday. I, I agree with you about all those points, although I'd also add that for all of Morrison and Dutton's strong words, they did nothing about the Port of Darwin. They did absolutely nothing. We all know the reality of Port of Darwin. You don't have to have another inquiry into it. And they didn't send a minister to Taiwan. You know, they threatened to go to war with China, but they wouldn't do the diplomatic stuff that would have made a difference. Now, I agree the, the Albanese government has gone into its shell. I don't think abandoning the dump, the anti-dumping action means much. We only take these anti-dumping actions to give us a little bit of leverage. They, they have no consequence. I mean, even if we won the anti-dumping action at the World Trade Organisation, the Chinese would just ignore it. And then it would be a question of would mm. we impose massive tariffs on the Chinese wind turbines? Well, if we did that, where else would we buy the wind turbines from. So I think this oh, has been nice a deliberate to make them strategy. Here, Greg. <laughs> well, yeah, indeed. I think this has been a quite deliberate strategy. China doesn't like being embarrassed at the WTO. So we withdraw these anti-dumping actions one by one as they lift their trade barriers on us. Now, I don't object fundamentally to that level of pragmatism so long as, but this is fundamental, so long as our government tells us, the Australian people, and the Chinese, and the international community, what the reality is. Now, when in their first six months in office, the Albanese government was good at this. Uh, Albanese and Miles now seem to have abolished their own backbones. But, I mean, at least in mm. Penny Wong, we've got one cabinet minister who is still willing to speak the truth to power publicly. Now, it's not much to hang our flag on, but it's, you know... Let's take... Oh, it's better than nothing, so to speak. All right, Greg, I know you've got difficulties with your line. I'll leave it there, but thank you for your insights uh, on an important day in the relationship. Thank you for your time. All right, let's go now to that uh, extraordinary move in Victoria by the Allen government late last week to fast-track their renewable energy plans, completely ignoring the mounting concerns of many regional communities. As you know, renewables, the rollout's not going to plan... But instead of changing course, the government seems to think doubling down is the answer. And somewhat ironically, removing the usual red and green tape that would put some of these major projects years behind. However, I was pleased to read this morning about the intervention from RMIT planning expert, Professor Michael Buxton, who's called out the Victorian government's plans as, quote, terrible decisions, with wind and solar farms being placed in the wrong locations. If the government won't listen to farmers, perhaps they'll listen to someone with Professor Buxton's credentials. I'm pleased to say he joins me now. Well, thank you for your time, Professor Buxton. Give us a sense of what the consequences are with this move by the Allen government in terms of the target now set at 95% renewables by 2035. Yes, well, Peter, one of the big consequences will be vast areas of land that will be given over to um, generating wind power and solar energy. Um, we don't really uh, know exactly how much, but um, th this would have been modelled. We're not being told this, but there are various estimates, but we do know that there will be very large areas of farmland and other, and other land with biodiversity and, and landscape and, and, and other, other value. Um, and it, this kind of action threatens in the long term Australia's food producing capacity and really will affect um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the biodiversity that's already under threat so what the government is really doing here is trading off environmental values um, it's saying um, generating renewable energy is fundamentally important over every other social economic and environmental uh, factor and, and nothing else really matters. Uh, and so really, uh, I think anybody who's been to places uh, in Europe um, and in Asia where uh, such large areas of land have been given over, we'll see what, what it's going to mean. Um, Spain, for example, uh, you can see um, solar panels to the horizon, North northern Europe with vast areas of wind generating 
areas and, and the same in China and so on. So uh, this is this is not good uh, because there are alternatives to doing this and the government isn't listening. What does it do to the rights of local councils and local communities? I mean, I was not long ago up in the Mallee. A lot of people there very angry about uh, transmission tower rollouts and what the point you made there, what it will do to arable farming land, their capacity to farm, uh, the capacity of the CFA to even get out there and fight fires in some of these landscapes. Um, you know, if a local council and, and local farmers and community members are upset about what's coming uh, their way, fast-tracked by these new law, law changes, what recourse do they have to have their say? They have very little legal recourse because um, to uh, what the government has done is taken away people's rights to object, um, uh, to often uh, even be notified. <laughs> Imagine that um, a huge uh, renewable energy project can be going up in your district or next door to you and you, you, you may not be even notified, much less be able to appeal against uh, the government decision. So the government is taking control of the process uh, the minister becomes the decision-making authority. Local governments are shut out of the process, and so so are local communities under under new planning um, regulations that the government passed late last year, which um, gives the minister the power to overrule normal planning processes under the Planning and Environment Act uh, in Victoria. And and I might say this is happening in. Uh, legislate, legislatively in New South Wales and and um, and Queensland and, and other states as well. There's a terrible, terribly worrying trend now for governments to just uh, really override all democratic processes and, and take autocratic control of, of massive um, project uh, delivery. Uh, and this is just another example. So regrettably, uh, there's very little that can be done other than political action. And really, I think one of the big issues here is the failure of local government to collectively stand up to state government. Um, and the challenge now really is for local government to mobilise their communities and work with them in generating um, campaigns against government. Uh, I mean, it's time that local government began to act politically um, instead of just being becoming an arm of the state government uh, as Premier's office. I think it's also very important, Professor Michael Buxton, for people like you with years of credibility in this area, though, to speak out publicly as you have. I don't suspect it's easy for a, an academic to, to come out as you have. But, I mean, it's one thing for me to talk about it here on Sky most nights. But I think when we talk to people like you, when we talk to farmers at the coalface, I think that's when local communities realise they're being done over. Yes, Peter, it's just terribly important that governments um, understand that there are other ways um, to achieve targets if, if, if they want to achieve this target. I mean, 95 per cent is a huge target. And unless the government um, becomes much more sensible about this, uh, then there will be terrible impacts and, and bad sighting. But fundamentally, the yeah. challenge for government is to understand that if you work with people and with communities and with affected people and a broader range of community interests than just the um, the vested interest with money to make, um, then you will yeah. get a better result. I mean, uh, uh, treating people like the enemy is not the solution because... We will get much better results if government actually works with affected people. And just one quick example: I mean, why, why isn't the government, in a strategic sense, working with people and and business to benefit business more directly than 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 um, than building over vast tracts of farmland and environmentally significant land? For example, over. In yep. the city itself, there are massive areas of warehousing and, and big box retailing and lots of roofs in cities that there's no plan to utilise better. So the government just needs to get better strategically in planning a solution. We'll come back to this, I'm sure. Professor Buxton, thank you for your time. There you go. An expert there saying that there's real problems. 95% renewables. God help us. But it's coming to a state near you as well as Chris Bowen's plans nationally. Quick break, panel, a whole lot more.
Welcome back, Kel Richards. A little bit later in the show, but let's bring in my panel now. Shadow Environment Minister Jonathan Dunningham and Senior Fellow at the Menzies Research Centre, Nick Cater. Well, gentlemen, welcome. Uh, Jonathan Dunningham, we've got this draft default market offer out. We've had it for 24 hours now. We've all chewed over it. Uh, there's reports today that 5 million households will see a significant increase in their bills if taxpayer subsidies aren't carried over. So there's a double whammy there, taxpayers and actual consumers. Now, they're never going to deliver this $275 power bill cut, as they promised. In fact, the analysis has proven, if you live in Western Sydney, and it's like this around the country, that under Labor, your bill's gone up $750. This is the disappointment. Well, disappointment's a very generous understatement, I've got to say. I mean, uh, the, the fact is it was a core promise of the last election to bring down power prices amongst other cost of living pressures. Power prices by 275. Analysis shows that uh, an ordinary average household has had their power bills go up by over $1,000, nearly 40% increase under this government. Now, you rightly point out, Peter, that their answer to this is to subsidise these bills it is taxpayers' money. The same people who are paying the higher power bills are having their tax dollars go to offsetting their power bill. That's not cheaper power. The answer is in supply, and the government haven't once turned their policy brains to how to attract more investment in bringing on more supply. And until they do that, until they get their blinkers off and remove the ideology from their approach here, we are going to see power prices to continue mm. to go up. And, and Nikita, this is, the, this is a... Um money go round, right? The only people getting rich in the case there from Jono is the power companies, funded by taxpayers, funded by consumers who are getting greater and greater licks of money coming in. And, and in the case of these wind turbines, I mean, I, I am furious that that trade action's been dropped. We'll be flooded yet again with Chinese wind turbines. 90-odd percent of our market comes from China. Uh, ditto with photovoltaics, solar panels. And, of course, we know... They're banking on offshore wind in a big way to get to these targets. A lot of those companies are foreign-owned. You know, they're out of yeah. the Netherlands, they're out of Norway, they're out of Europe. Australians will lose jobs here. The money's not staying in Australia. They're all bankrolled by our subsidies. And the poor old punter in Penrith are paying power bills that they are literally making decisions. Can they afford to turn a heater on in a country as rich and resource-prosperous as Australia. Yeah, it's bad enough that most of this investment is coming from overseas and so the profits will go overseas. But it's worse in the case of China. And giving the green light to China to just move in to the turbine market and do what it did with solar panels, which is basically to become the dominant player in the market as a first step to becoming the only player in the market. 85% you know, of the world's solar panels come from China. Then, then we, what, we're, we're just walking straight into a trap. Peter, we really are. And it's the same with electric vehicles. 87% of the electric vehicles bought in Australia yesterday, last year came from China, and that includes two Teslas, the Tesla Y and the Tesla Model 3. Uh, and then you, you go to the transmission lines, where all the steel, the aluminium cable, the whole box and dice is largely coming from China. We are going to be absolutely in debt to China by the end of the, the century, end of the decade, sorry. We won't be able to do anything in the energy sector without them. And Chris Bowen talks about us becoming a renewable energy superpower. I mean, he's delusional, quite frankly, Peter. China is already the dominant renewable energy superpower and will be the only one for some time to come. And, of course, Jono, alongside national security increasingly this, this, uh, the, the term energy security. And, it, and if Nick's scenario plays out, which it will, our terms of trade will go the other way. You know, a wind turbine is a lot more expensive than a lobster. We'll owe China money. We're already deeply in debt. We owe a lot of our money overseas. Well, we'll owe it to China. But we're also, in an energy security sense, incredibly vulnerable. I mean, how do we fight back against a Chinese invasion in our region if China's paying our power bills, or sorry, supplying our power in this country. I mean, this is what concerns me, is how short-sighted all of this is. For what? For what? We're not even one and a bit percent of global emissions. 
Yeah, again, ideology driving decision making around the future of our country is always going to end in disaster. COVID was a very expensive lesson and you have the Labor Party telling us that we spent a trillion dollars with nothing to show for it. You know, we have a functioning economy at the end of it, I might point out. But one thing I got out of COVID was the fact that we as a country should be more self-reliant, should be more dependent on our own resources rather than the resources of other foreign uh, powers like China or other countries for that matter. So the decisions that are being made that make us more exposed and more vulnerable, uh, leading us into a situation where we will be paying more at the behest of other countries, I think is gross negligence on the part of this government. And again, as I said before, there's no answer. There's no uh, response to this problem. They don't seem to think it's a problem in the Labor Party. They're happy to sign our sovereignty away in many areas including in energy security, it appears, and that is incredibly concerning for every Australian uh, of every demographic in every part of the country. I might add, too, I mean, I sat here talking to someone who was making masks, the only Australian manufacturer of masks during COVID left, and they had to send the army in because they didn't have enough workers. We were importing all of our masks from China and we weren't getting any. Um, just quickly before we go, Nick, UNRWA, the government's put the money back in, a lot of opposition to that. The inquiry into links between UNRWA and uh, October 7 still has not concluded. Penny Wong, though, was out there saying she has, quote, necessary confidence that all of our aid would go to Gaza. Are you confident that's right? I have zero confidence, Peter. This is a reckless and dangerous decision. It's driven by appeasing the left in the Labor Party. It's nothing to do with the facts on the ground, which all suggest that we should stay clear of UNRWA for the time being. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. See you both next week. Or right after the break, Kel Richards. Welcome back. Joining me as he does every Wednesday, our resident wordsmith, Mr Kel Richards. Well, hair of the dog, we love this one. Ken, one of our viewers, wants to know, maybe he hits the terps and he wants to know what it means before he drinks it, but uh, give, us, give us the literary interpretation at the very least. OK. When people talk about the hair of the dog, they nearly always say, if you've got a hangover, what you need is a stiff drink. That will cure it. The full expression is a hair of the dog that bit you. Because the theory is a small amount of what made you sick will make you well. It comes from a theory called homeopathy, which is one of these pseudo-scientific um, alternative medicine things, uh, based on the like mm -hmm. cures mm -hmm. like. So if something made you sick, a small amount of it or a diluted amount of it will make you better. Uh, it's nuts as a theory of medicine, I have to say, but it's where hair of the dog comes from. Now, my mother used to say this one to me when I was at university. I played pretty hard. She used to say, you're living the life of Riley. Well, Trevor, another one of our viewers, says, uh, where does this one come from? Who's Riley? Well, there was a Riley, I think. This is only probable, hard to be certain, but I think it was an Irish love story. William Riley, back in the 1700s, eloped with his young sweetheart which was a crime in those days, in fact, a capital crime. But he was saved from being executed when the young lady said that she was not abducted, she went with him voluntarily. And it was a big story and everyone in Ireland knew it. It was told in ballads and songs in the 18th and 19th centuries, even in a novel, uh, Willie Riley and his uh, Colleen in the mid-1800s. So it, it, it simply became one of those expressions that grew out of their well-known love story. Oh, well, that's got a nice little sort of story. It's a nice it. one, isn't we it? We like that yeah. one. What, what about rolled gold? Because I've heard this used a lot. Uh, Francis, another one of our viewers, wants to know, you know, we talk about a policy and we says it's a rolled gold policy. What's the rolled gold mean? It means very good, and it's being compared with gold plating, which is not nearly as good. With rolled gold, uh, actual gold, a very thin layer of gold is applied to the surface of whatever it is, a watch or a piece of jewellery or something, uh, by a, a system called heat, uh, heating and bonding, so that you get real 14 karat, 16 karat gold actually attached to the item itself, which gold plating can never do. So if you want something which is really good... Roll gold is better than mm. gold plating. Therefore, anything which is very good is the roll gold version of it. I'm not sure I've got time to get the last one in, Kel, but we might give you a promo. Tell people where they can go to put some words in for next week. 
Okay, ozwords, ozwords.com.au. There's a contact page and your questions are really welcome. Ozwords, ozwords.com.au. Yeah, test us. Put us under pressure. Kel Richards, see you next week. Thank you, as always. All right, that's it for me. Big show tonight, big one tomorrow night. Back at six, here's Andrew Bolt.